Well, y'all, we had a lot of fun last week, but it's time to get back to work. We've been getting a lot of emails from our listeners, and there seems to be one common theme from across the West. Where'd all the elk go? Well, y'all, they're still out there. So let's talk about common problems and solutions for the post rut and for the late season periods, dealing with the moon, wind, feed patterns, and how our own understanding and mentality of elk behavior sometimes, well, is a day late and a dollar short. Those topics along with our Elk Bros shout outs and questions from our Elk Bros mailbox. So my friends, pull up a chair and adjust your volumes just right. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkBros.com with your host, Gilbert Arnellis and elk hunting coach, Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk and they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello again, everyone your first time with us glad to have you hope you enjoy our show and for those blue collar hunters following our show out there grinding it out with us every week welcome back to elk camp i'm gilbert ornelis coming to you from spring texas and joining me from new mexico your elk hunting coach joe Gillian. what's up joe hey man just rolled in man <laughs> joe's been out in the elk woods guys i'm jealous yeah 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 just literally um, just before we got on, I was out uh, checking out the evening for the morning hunt, and uh, tomorrow for us, we've got a snowstorm coming in, and and I think a big key for a lot of those guys out there is we're starting to get some change in barometric pressure, no doubt. and that's starting to change that elk behavior a little bit, and I, I think that's a real key for people that we get some change in weather we get some things that are happening get some of these animals moving get some of them that are coming down and and right now as we're going to talk about in a little bit all about feed man so we're i'm really really pumped about uh tonight and talking about this topic because like you said so many guys that are you know they're like man where are the elk they are just not acting like you know, like they have been in the last 30 years, the last 10 years. So it's going to be a great discussion tonight, Gilbert. No doubt. Joe, before we get a, get there and talk about where all the elk are, our listeners come shout first. Out. You shout know what out. time it is. Shout it's time shout for the out. Elk Bro shout outs. <laughs> oh, if you're new to our show, these are just our shout outs to a few cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week. Yes, sir. And leading our chart just across the Red River from Fargo, North Dakota. And it's here that you'll find out just how tough a potato or a spud can be, Gilbert. <laughs> you don't really, Gilbert, did you know a spud can actually take out a buffalo? Mm -mm. <laughs> yes, sir. So, you know, I had, I saw this and I know it happened back in February, but being a high school coach, I really wanted to do a little shout out to these guys, man. So back in February, okay, back in February, the Spuds defeated the undefeated Buffalo Bisons that season to make it to their 19th straight Minnesota Class 2A Section 8 Hockey Championship. Oh, that's and awesome. That was the Spuds, buddy, of Moorhead, Minnesota. Yeah! Yeah! Moorhead, <laughs> Minnesota in the house, the land of a million lakes. Yes, sir. Awesome, <laughs> man. Lakes, uh, I think you added a few there. But <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Dude, there's a lot of water in Minnesota. Just check it out on Google Earth. Google Earth's a strong thing, or Onyx for sure. <laughs> Heck yeah, bud. <laughs> Guys, this is the 12th largest city in Colorado. It hosts the world's largest 4th of July rodeo in 2016. Its city water was rated number one for best tasting. And in an effort to overcome historical criticisms of agricultural odor, the city government initiated an odor hotline for locals to call and complain about any and all nose holding experiences. <laughs> that, my friends, and I've been through there, it's quite the 
nose holder. That's Greeley, Colorado. I've worked in the oil field up there. Greeley, Greeley in the house, man. Greeley, Colorado. And, uh, you know, when you have people, you get that stigma. And we all know what a lot of our towns, I mean, heck, go through some of those uh, border oh, you, cities and stuff in Texas in the middle bet, of summer man. over there, man. Ooh, they got them feed lots. Whew. Those feed lots. Oh, man. Yeah. Powerful. And, you know, and I know a lot of these places, they, you know, they try to overcome that. And Greeley, you know, really has tried to do something where they have an odor hotline in that community, man. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, I used to tell my grandpa when we go to the feed sale, when we go to the, the sale barn, and take our heifers and our calves and cows to sell. I'd say, golly, man, that stinks like, you know what, Grandpa? He said, smelled like money to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, 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 so I was at a buddy's house in Clayton, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. They had them big feed lots there. And I was standing there, and oh, my God, that smell. And we're sitting there in, in his living room, and he says to his wife, he's like, honey, will you get that young in there? Man, something's going on in that diaper. I mean, it, it, you, we got to have that boy changed. And I turned, I was like, Dude, how can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly oh, for living here. <laughs> all smells like money to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No doubt. All right. The local Native Americans call it the place where the two creeks meet. With the most sunshine in British Columbia, you can float the St. Mary's River, fly fish the Bull River, or experience the Fort Steele Heritage Sound a living history museum that allows you to experience what it was like to live in the days gone by, man. Just an incredibly beautiful place. And now, this time, third on our list, another Canadian province, Cranbrook, British Columbia. Cranbrook, British Columbia. Man, thanks to all the Canadians up there that give us our, their time and listen to our show uh, man, I, I want to do a, a bear hunt in BC. I hear it's awesome. Uh, the black bear hunt. I want to do any kind of hunt in BC, bro. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. Like, I'm in. I, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to do that. And I don't know if this is just Tucker's family. He's calling people up there or what, but you know. man, no doubt. I, we need to get him on that pretty quick. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> up next, they love their dogs, parks, beer, and puffy jackets. But what most people don't know about this town is that because of the volcanic terrain in the area, astronauts use the train here to prepare for the rocky and unpredictable surface of the moon. In fact, Apollo 15 astronaut Jim Irwin actually saved and placed a volcanic rock from the area on the moon in Bend, Oregon. Big Bend. Bend, Oregon. Now, I, I would think that if they just went up there to where we elk hunt, Joe, they'd have all that crap they wanted. I can <laughs> yeah. promise you, walking through that <laughs> stuff ain't no picnic. No, no, you're you're exactly right, man. We're and not divulging where we're doing it, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of volcanic rock here in New Mexico, oh but and let me tell you what, I think I have found 80% of them because if you can hunt where we hunt, looking for elk at the same time and stay from falling on your face. <laughs> oh man. I've watched Joe in front of me all year about eat it three or four times, me kicking rocks, bang, bang, about falling down. I did fall down. Uh, <laughs> look, I got a brand new pair of boots. They ain't brand new no more. I can tell you that Joe, they look like they've been eight years old and drug down nine miles of oil field road. Yeah, it's that's tough country. He could have definitely gotten a rock from our area. For sure. So, last but not least, known as the Magic City, here are some quick definitions to help you here. The rims are the sandstone cliffs that surround the city. The west end is where you find the mall, shopping and eateries and boutiques. I thought it was funny here, boutiques. It just doesn't kind of fit this area of boutiques <laughs> anyway. The Metra is the multi-event center and the fairgrounds. And the Heights is the eastern section. That's where you can find, oh, my niece calls it Target. She tries yeah. to upclass Target. Yeah, yeah. Target and Walgreens. But wherever you go, guys, gals, jeans are good because it's casual Friday every day here in Billings, Montana. Awesome, man. I've always wanted to hunt in Montana, Joe. They got grizzlies up there, so you got to be on your toes. Yeah, you know, in fact, um, just had uh, a fellow that was down here hunting in New Mexico uh, from Montana and had some 
man, I tell you, God, the guy had more drama happen here. And, and I, I just want to tell y'all, look, Gilbert, I'm going to step on my soapbox for a second here. Get on with it. Preach on, Joe. You know, guys, 99.9% of the hunting community is just incredible people. But there's 0.1% of some real low life turds out there. That's the only, I mean, you got to call a spade a spade, Gilbert. Amen. And I mean, there's some of those people out there that, you know, uh, that make and feed off of making other people miserable, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, a friend of mine, Dennis came down here in New Mexico from Montana and, uh, you know, uh, it, it just was a shame some of the things he went through here. And uh, God, I, I, I felt horrible that our own state, I, I felt ashamed that some of the things that happened to this guy when he was here. And, and you know, I, I tell you what, it wasn't just in New Mexico because we get letters from people all over the yeah. West. And, mm -hmm. you know, I talked to a, a guy up in Colorado that uh, had his vehicle busted into all his equipment taken. And, mm. and it just so happened that the person that was doing this, actually was hitting all kinds and believe it or not they caught this fella in durango colorado when when they were getting their vehicle fixed the they got a, a credit alert that somebody was buying tires with their credit card across the street bro <laughs> Get oh my this. so they catch the guy go to his room he had rented two rooms at a local motel both of them full of hunting and camping gear from where he was just you know making victimizing people and uh so they caught him but you know it doesn't stop there because if your gear ends up in a crime they hold on to that stuff until yeah. that case is done and that's right you, you, you don't end up get being a two-time yeah you end up being a two-time victim it just seems like but you know that happened uh, i i know of a fella that <laughs> had his <laughs> he texted me and said someone took my elk yeah, honestly yeah yeah so there's going to be a lot of these stories on our on our website and we're going to talk about these i think we're going to do an episode where we just talk about some of this stuff and you know and that it's, it's a shame that we have to think about it and that that 0.1% is out there. But there are people like that out there. And I think all of us as a community, as a hunting community, have to continue to not let this tear us down and to be there to support each other when something mm -hmm. like that happens. Because I tell you what, the first thing I did when these fellows went through that is I called some buddies up in their area and said, will you take care of them? And, and uh and they did. I mean, jumped right up to it, and which is really cool. And, and uh, I, you know, guys, we've got to take care of each other. And it's so important because what we do, this freedom that we have, and this ability to go out on public land, everybody has the right to do that. And none of us deserve to be victimized when we're trying to do something that is our heritage. So, guys, when you're out there, keep an eye open for your buddy. Don't let people be victimized. Step up be the bigger person, uh, help each other out. And, and that's, I'm going to step off the box for tonight and we'll get going. Yeah, here, no, I'm, I'm with you, Joe. You know, we, we hunt public land and we come across guys all the time and I ain't never yep. met a stranger. You know that. Uh, yep. and, and look, there's no doubt when you're in the middle of a set and somebody comes traipsing through there, it's a little aggravating, but dude, you use that as a time to make friends and, and communicate, let them know what you got going on, where, you know, where you're going to be. And a lot of times that helps them understand where they need to be. Just that little bit of communication, a little thoughtfulness in a, it could be a stressful time, but you don't have to make it that way. You know, no, it's all and, how you handle the situation that really defines you as a person. You know, integrity is a big thing and most of it's doing the right thing while nobody else is watching. But at, there the, you go. at the end of the day, uh, I like what we do and how we handle adversity. Uh, I like that, you know, if we meet somebody in the woods, we always make it a, a point of at least talking to them and, and, and being cordial, you know, and, and winning friends, you know, sure. my grandpa told me, it taught me a long time ago, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. And you got to remember, all of us always talk about it's not the kill. It's about the hunt. It's about the journey along the way. And I tell you what, these experiences and these people are a huge part of the journey. And I have found out that the world gets to be a really little place, man. And you bump into people who know people who know people who know people. And, you know, Dennis 
I had him and I have never met face to face. We've only through the phone, text, emails. Yeah. And you know, when he texted me that and I, I called him immediately, but he was on top of he said 10,000 feet on top of a mountain when I called him and I just felt horrible, you know, and he really couldn't believe he's like, man, I can't believe how much you're helping me out. And I was like, bro, this is my home state, Yeah, yeah. you know, and I believe in hospitality. I believe in our community and, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to do whatever I can to try to make it up and help you guys out. So, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that's, I think more of us do that. It gets passed on. Uh, it has a ripple effect and, and I think it just, we all, it all becomes a better place. And we do that in our personal life. Too. Yeah. You know, guys, if you've never seen the movie, pay it forward. It's truly a deal, man. Pay it forward. It's always, if you pay it forward, it's going to make it better for everybody else. You know, you know Gilbert, that's why we do this whole thing anyway. Right. Yeah, that's it. You, that's it. You know, sure. and I, I talked to a fella today that said, you know, that they came across our podcast and they really couldn't believe how much was in it and how much educational and, and, you know, guys, we're going to, we're going to have our business end of it that we're going to try to make our dollar from, you know, to pay for all of this and pay for what we're doing. But I tell you what, we have really made it a point to try to give you guys, you know, something of value, some quality and to educate and to coach and in the hopes of you guys out there experiencing the incredible things that we've been able to experience in, in yeah. our time doing this. So you bet. So that's where we're going to get started. So cool. uh, Joe, we've been getting a lot of letters from our guys that have had yep. a tough season and a lot of questions from these guys. So uh, probably got to just get right to it and start helping these guys, you know? Yeah. And we're going to cover some of these problems and the things that they've sent into us that, that we've been hearing from them. But I think one of the biggest problems out there and guys, um, you know, I used to hear this from my, my dad and my grandpa oh, all the man, time. No so, you doubt. know, I'd do something like, you know, dude, you're a day late and a dollar short, yep. right? And I don't know so much about the dollar part of it, but I think a big part of the issues our hunters are experiencing out there is because a lot of times we're working with where elk were instead of where they're, where they are. I mean, a lot of time, a lot of things that I've heard so far is guys said, man, I was in this area and it was just tore up, man. Well, yeah, you know, it was tore up in September, you know, the 15th, the 16th, the 20th, up to October 1st, you know, and then you hear the same thing. You have guys that have trail cams out during the summer and they're seeing all these bull elk, man. And then come September 1, when they're out there, they're going, where'd the bulls go? You know, yeah, yeah. it's because guys a lot of times are dealing with elk where they were instead of where they are. Mm -hmm. And I think a big part of that is really understanding elk, elk behavior, and really thinking about all these things that are affecting them, right? You know, you told me a little while ago, elk are where you find them, right? Yeah, they're where they're at. And I, I know a lot of people say, well, that's one of the most overused statements but guys man it look when we went in to go hunt this year we had our game plan a b c d right and i tell you what we really thought plan a was where the acorns were i mean it was so <laughs> full of acorns oh my Pinion gosh. crop was coming out there was water there grass was high we go down there it, nothing i mean it was like crickets <laughs> it was <laughs> the, I mean, there, it was quiet man yeah. now there were bulls down there um here and there but man at the time that we thought they'd have been responding to something they just weren't mm-hmm. and we go to another area that's at a different elevation and all of a sudden we've got some cows there we got some hot cows we got some bulls screaming and most people were not experiencing that because people hunt where they, where the elk were instead of where they are. And what you have to realize is you guys got to think what is happening now. Think about that right now. So right now 
Um, today is October 23rd. When this comes out, I think we're looking at like the 29th or the 30th, right? When this episode comes out. So we're talking late October. So we're post rut right now. Yeah. We're in post rut. And so what has happened in post rut guys? So you had those herd bulls that were running with those cows. Now I, I guarantee you, I'm going to tell you, this was one of the strangest seasons in a lot of the West, not everywhere, but in a lot of places, you it know, it happened early. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I talked to people in Colorado, that I talked heat. to people in Idaho, that heat that we had, man, uh, it was hot. And when you, and people said, okay, and we had the full moon that killed us. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the full moon, but it's not the full moon that's killing you. I mean, when it was hot like that, those animals were not wanting to get up. They were coming when that temperatures were cooler, thinking about them moving down in the thermals. So if they're up on a ridge and they're waiting for thermals to start and, and they feel all this barometric pressure, those critters, barometric pressure and thermals to them, that's like, you know, that's like us smelling cooking in the kitchen. We right. know when it's time to eat, right? Yeah. So they feel that and they do not want to put themselves in a dangerous situation. So if they're waiting for thermals to start changing, you know, then they're going to make their move at the right time. And that's going to be later in the evening. And a lot of times that temperature was not moving and dropping down until after Almost, 1030, yeah. after midnight, yep. you know, and they had the moon with that so that, man, they could be a little bit more active in that moonlight. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there were a lot of funky things happening because it's, it really seemed like this year, because, guys, bulls are real efficient about their breeding. You know, in an area where there's a high bull-to-cow ratio, like we've told you before, there might be a herd bull, but that herd bull isn't the only one that breeds those cows. He's not able to. <laughs> yeah. it's just it's just physically not possible so you know after he breeds a cow that that cow is going to be bred multiple times by man between you know three to six bulls yeah you know if there's bulls in the area yeah right well what it seemed like happened this year i don't know why and i don't know if it was the heat or what but it seemed like everything blew up in the second estrus mm -hmm. It just seemed like that was when things were going crazy. I mean, on one of our big ranches here, I had a buddy of mine guiding there that said, man, things blew up. And it was the 11th of October, and I had the most incredible call in that I've ever had in my career up here. In on the week of the 11th and then the following week, get this, killed two herd bulls. When generally the eighth, they're starting to peel off right oh, yeah. around that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Killed two herd bulls. One of them was a 374. The next week was a 383. Wow. Those giant bulls. And, and, but the point being, those big boys had not peeled off. They waited a little bit, mm -hmm. man, and they waited till that second estrus. So, mm -hmm. you know, you guys got to think about what's happening right now. And so right now, what mode are elk in right now? They're in recovery mode. Yeah, recovery. Slaves to their bellies. So tonight, on the ranch that I was on this evening that I'm guiding in the morning, we hadn't seen elk in a week, right? I went in tonight, and there's a herd of 150 cows with a few small satellites in it out in the bottoms just feeding like, I mean, heads down chowing. Why? Yeah. Because our barometric pressure is falling, and we got a storm coming in tonight. Yeah. So those guys are coming down, and they're feeding like crazy. So, you know, if you read into that stuff, man, and, and, and you understand that now, those bulls that are with those cows, they're not in there pushing them. They're not in there breeding now. We still have a chance for a third estrus to pop open, but uh, right now, those big bulls, they're pretty much in the point now that you can pattern them. They're not wanting to work too hard. They're going from feed to where they're going up to where they're bedding, yep. and they're, Gilbert, their bedding changes now too, man. Oh, yeah. You know, because you if, if temperatures are staying low and those daytime temperatures staying low, then those guys are going to stay low because now most of those thermals are doing what? They're falling. That's right. 
You know what I'm saying? So they're not wanting to be in that upper third of, of the ridge. They're wanting to be in that lower third on the ridge. So a lot of these guys, they're going from feed up onto the side, sometimes into feed areas. They want to be where they can see good. Um, they want to be where they're close to water, generally within a half mile, man, mm -hmm. of that water. So you're looking for those areas that have got that sanctuary that got some feed next to it where they can get a little bit of feed and then they can get to water without expending a lot of energy. So think about that, guys. Think about what is going on. Okay. Yeah, you know, Joe, I was up in northeast, very northeastern part of New Mexico, southeastern part of Colorado. And right. the 13th of August, man, we – of August? October. I'm sorry, October. Yeah, there you the go. 13th of October. Man, it was all morning. Uh, we didn't hear a bugle, right? I mean, nothing. Right. So it, the two bulls that I did see, they had their mouths wide open. They were, it was hot, you know, and right. they were, they were looking to go to water. Uh, they were wore out. They'd done lost probably 200 pounds. Right. Uh, I mean, they, the rut was really hard on them the past three to four weeks. They've been going super strong, but man, by the, by the 17th, when we left, it was over, you know, I mean, yeah. we, they just, they'd shut up and man, it was tough to find them, you know, right. tough to find them, but you knew they had to come to water and you knew they had to feed. So, um, that, you know, that kind of helped us being able to switch gears and instead of, you know, going listening for bugles and stuff like that, we just had to hunt the, the high percentage areas where they were going to go to water and where they were going to go and uh, come out and eat in the evenings, you know. So yeah, I and, think and, you're 100% correct, man. You got to go back to where you know they're going to be because they got to recoup. And and it's different. Sometimes these guys, instead of being up high on ridges, are now down in deep canyons. And, yeah. And, and the reason for that, again, is think about their safety. Think no about pressure. the thermals. Mm -hmm. Think about those types of things that are happening. You know, if they're down in the bottom of a canyon and it's a cold day, and those temperatures are staying down there low under the yeah. 40s, mm -hmm. and you've got all those thermals falling right down to them now. So, Well, and, and two, they've been hunted since the 1st of September. They've had pressure yeah. on them the whole time, right? Yeah. Uh, especially in high traffic areas and, you know, even on private ranches, they've had pressure on them the whole time. So they're yeah. a whole lot more or less forgiving of, of scenarios of, you know, hearing things, seeing things. They're just less forgiving. But guys, some of this is getting ready to change though, because as they have gone into rest and recover, man, winter's coming on and now they got to start eating like crazy. Yeah. So they're going to actually sacrifice a little bit of that sanctuary to get to that food. And you can really find these guys in a lot of these bottoms that uh, what I call side canyons that have got those bottoms going on. You know, you got your big canyons, you got those little drainages that come into it. And a lot of them have those little grassy bottoms. Those guys will, instead of coming into that big bottom oh, open yeah. area, they'll go in those side channels and they'll just drop down, eat, get to some water right down there generally in that bigger canyon down there and go right back up in they they don't go too far so yeah. but they are going to have to start eating and you're going to start seeing instead of one you're going to start seeing bacheloring back up again yeah. so you're going to find them in groups of three five six i've seen groups of 10 man together yeah. so yep. uh it's it's getting ready especially you get this late november early december if you guys have a hunt in that time that is prime time to find a big bull because they have to come out and eat. All right. Yeah. So let's talk about some problems that we've heard from some of our guys, Gilbert, and talk about that. Like um, one of the, one of the letters and some of the stuff we got is we hunted an area for 10 days and didn't see an elk, <laughs> you know? And so here's a couple things that I ask people like that. Well, f first of all, my main one is, why did you stay there for 10 days, man? I mean, uh, and you're out there and you're not seeing hide nor hair. If you're not seeing no sign, you know, when do you pull the plug? If I'm not seeing any sign after two days, I haven't smelled an elk. I haven't Vamanos. seen the fur of an elk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, I'm, I tell you what, I'm, I'm out of there, man. I, I need to go look someplace else, especially if I only have 10 days. So a lot of times I ask guys too, well, how are you hunting this? Are you hunting with legs or are you hunting with optics? Because this changes 
exactly the opposite of from the archery season. Archery season, I don't need binos. Right, right? all about legs, yep. Yeah, and but when it comes to this rifle season, man, you let your optics do the walking for you. Now, sure. if it's feasible in the area that you're hunting, because some places are so thick, it doesn't work out all the time, but hopefully you can find some area with some bottoms where you can get to a high point and you can check those out in the morning. And you guys, listen to me, man. You have to be there at daybreak, especially like if you were in the situation that we were in and where we had moon and we had hot weather, those dudes are moving up into those trees Quickly. early, early. And what you want to do is you want to be there where you can see them now watch where they're going to bed down and then you can make a move on them. All right. Now, if you're in a place that like, God, would Montana get 40 inches of snow during that, during that week, you know, then it's a little different thing. I mean, now you can actually, you can hunt down, you know, you can wolf hunt them, you can track them down and, and find them in their beds. Uh, so, I mean, you can spot track. There's a lot of things you can do on that. And those animals are going to get pushed down somewhat, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's the thing I tell you is, if you can, guys, let your optics do as much. That's why I like to pick areas where I, I like the burns or I like more open hillsides that have got some choked areas that are prime time where my glasses can work for me. Not every area is conducive to that. I totally get it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if it's like that, then you got to think about where those critters are. And if you're hunting with a rifle, that, that can be tough, man, because you're talking about now you're basically jumping critters you know, going That's through right. there. Right. Um, you know, I have, I, I, again, I kept hearing guys saying, we saw all this sign from the rut. They had totally blown up the area. We well, all rut was over and they had moved. And what I found was a lot of these guys either went up in elevation or they went down in elevation. Mm -hmm. the, the area that I was in Gilbert, we went up there and we went where it was prime time for us in oh, September. Man, oh man. Sure. guess what <laughs> yeah nada <laughs> nada and so and here's what happened when i was driving in to take the guy i was with i passed five bulls down along the road down on the bottom five bulls <laughs> wow. right and i'm like why am, I, why am i going up high you know <laughs> i mean i might not be the brightest cookie Stacking in the barrel but I was like, okay, if that's where they're at, that's where we need to hunt them. And sure enough, we stayed down in the bottom where everybody else was going up. And the first morning I located five bulls. We got a cold morning. Um, all five of them actually bugled, but by eight o'clock they were done. Yeah. It was over. Okay. Y'all took um, a nice bull too. Yeah. Beautiful yeah, it was a bull. Real nice bull. Uh, I kept hearing the elk are always here. Mm -hmm. well evidently not yeah <laughs> you know you, you can't be stubborn about that you can't go well they've been here for 30 years so they got to be here now not necessarily you know everything in the world can you know anything can happen when those cows decide they want to move they gone right and generally bulls this time of year follow the cows but as we're transitioning out of this those bulls are going to be just where you talked about, where they can get to food and water and accessible and keep pressure off of them so they can rest. Yes. They're yes, wore so out, man. Th those They're big tired. guys, they don't want anything to do with the cows. Those big guys are off, man. That's They're, right. You know, uh, at first they isolated themselves totally, and then they're going to start bacheloring up. Yeah. But they're not herd oriented right now they're mm -hmm. they're really trying to take care of themselves and yeah you know, like you said when you was down there passing all those bulls on the way in when nobody had to hit you in the face with a crappy mop i mean dang you done pass five of them you know i mean golly you so so you you know pay attention to what the elk are telling Right. And I mean, these weren't elk that I could hunt because I was passing through private areas. Yeah, yeah, but, but but the whole thing was they were down in the bottom and yeah. and that was that message came through loud and clear. Yeah, and you were gonna uh, gain you were gonna gain another fifteen, eighteen hundred feet, two thousand feet. And why did right. you have to, you know, if you if you didn't right. have to, right? Yeah. And uh, another thing is this is when people say they're always here, they we have short memories sometimes because 
as in New Mexico, just like in Colorado, last couple of years, we had these incredibly dry, you know, seasons, hot seasons, and uh, where water was prime time, places there, and, and good grass were limited to certain areas. You know, I mean, even if you got some snowpack, it wasn't as much, and we didn't have that much of a wet spring. Well, this year, not only did we have a great snowpack, yeah. but we had an incredible spring. Yeah. So now food was Abundant. everywhere. Yeah. So Abundant. instead of your elk being concentrated, in an area. Now those elk are going to be dispersed. Yeah. They're going to be moved out to different areas. So the areas that were traditionally where you found big groups changed real quick, mm -hmm. right? So elk always being here, that argument does not always hold up. And if you are not finding that sign, don't be stubborn about it. You know, Keep if moving. you are still smelling the elk and stuff in there, well, okay, then you're finding sign, right? Yeah. Um, I kept hearing the bulls just aren't responding. And I think a lot of times people forget that because a bull doesn't bugle doesn't mean he's not responding. There's so many times I think guys are doing calls in, in different ways and they have bulls coming into them silent or they're doing other type of low calls. Um, and they're actually coming into them. And I think a lot of times guys aren't patient enough. How many times have we been doing a cold call setup, mm. get impatient, get up and bingo. <laughs> there, Dude, it happened to us this year when you killed your bull. You yeah. know, we just got done doing a set and here we, you know, we, we'd run into a couple hunters. You just, we just got doing a set, you know, we start checking off. We ain't made it 75, maybe a hundred yards, 120 yards. And boom, right. here we got, you know, we got them standing there looking at us. You know, they've been coming the whole way. You know, right. they could hear us, no doubt, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it happened to us several times. Man. It happened to me and no Pennsylvania cat killer, too, man. I mean, had them coming up. I, that's something we learned. Guys, put one guy looking behind you. It doesn't matter if it is downwind. Put a guy looking behind you because here we're sitting there making a really good call set and looking out in front of us and to our left and to our right. And, Bull sneaks in there 40 yards behind us, big old five by five, you know, five by six. And right. Brendan, Brendan turns around and goes, oh, my gosh, dude, he's standing <laughs> right there. I mean, you know, that's a pretty rookie mistake, but I'm, I'm not claiming to be no pro. Uh, but at the end of the day, you guys learn from that, man. Get a guy looking at your six. Well, that's what this is all about. We're trying to teach you guys from our mistakes, right? Yeah, so, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of ways that bulls respond that, you know, we think that the only response they're going to do is bugle. And that's not the only way that they no. respond. They, they can start raking a tree, you know, they can start doing some low huffing, some low grunting. Um, yeah. They will just come in silent. My favorite technique is to move through calling slowly, uh, uh, moving slowly and have guys check in on each side while I'm looking forward. I try not to worry behind me because I'm working into the wind, but we're looking for bulls that are coming in silent off of the sides. And guys, we have killed a lot of elk that way. So oh, man. Yeah. never saying a word. And people are like, well, wow, man, that booger was coming in quiet. Hey, but he was coming in. Yeah. So that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the uh, other one I kept hearing was the moon killed us. All right. So here's my take on that. Um, you you got to make lemonade out of lemons. And if that moon is bright enough for those animals to be out there, it's bright enough for you to be moving in the moonlight to locate them. And the one time that you can really use binos during the archery season or the early rifle season is when you have a moon out there. And now yeah. you can actually, because you're a good optics will really pull in more light and you can actually get out there and locate animals feeding in some of those areas and get in position before daylight. Now, all right. So let's say it gets daylight and you look at them, they're moving up into the trees before that happens. All right. No problem. If you see animals going up, look at what type of year is. If it's a time of year when it's going to get warm, that means they're going to go up to that. They're going to go up two-thirds up that hill. They're going to try to find a bench where they feel Shame. safe. Mm -hmm. Take your Onyx. 
take a look at it on that ridge that they're going up and see if you can't find on those uh, on those lines that you have, on those topo lines, see if you can't locate where one of those benches are. Then you want to get yourself up at the same level, oh, you know, on the downwind side, so your thermal's not going up to it. Wait till that noon time there, and now you've got a place to call from. Or you, you know, you can call in. You want to be at their level. You don't want to be down below them or up above them. You want to try to get at your level if, if you can, as much as possible. Or if you can glass and you can put them to bed and you can see where they're at, now you can make a move on them during that rifle season, man. You can get to an upper level on them to where you can get a great shot looking down at them. I mean, you just got to hunt it. You don't just go throw your hands up in there and go, it's over. Because look, y'all. You've been waiting 360 some days yeah. to get out there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you've got 10 days out of that in order to make something happen. And so you can either go out and we can make excuses and we can just give our, you know, throw our hands up and say it's not going to happen. Or you can be that predator. Uh, I got news for you. There ain't no cougars going. Well, moon's <laughs> out. It's too windy. Yeah. Guess I'm not going to eat this month. Mm. You know, no, well, man. When they're I mean, hungry, they eat. Yeah. So I'm just telling you, yeah. you know, think about ways that you can utilize that. Because what we did just a week ago yeah. was we actually moved, you know, we went out there. We found the bulls when they were just barely on the side of the hill. Never came down into the clearing where we could get a shot. But we could see them on the side of the hill knew that they were going to come down that evening there into the water. So we were able to use the moon the next morning to go get in position, get in a high point, spot that booger at daylight. Man, he was just going up the side of the hill already at daylight. But because he was doing that, we were able to make a move and with the rifle get a great 300-yard shot, and boom, it was over. But we utilized the moon yeah. to our advantage. Great stuff, man. That's awesome, Joe. And I guess my whole point is, is man, is don't let conditions find the silver lining in every condition if you can. Mm. All right. So that's like the other one. The wind was howling, you know. <laughs> so where do you want to look for bull elk when the wind is howling, wherever the wind's not howling? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, they like and being think, in bowls. Yeah. I mean, that's where, same thing for us, man. I, again, we start to be stubborn. We go, well, the elk were here. This is where they were feeding. This is where they should be. So an elk survives by their senses. And if the wind is blowing all over the place, it's so hard for them to pick up on this number one sight because yeah. everything's moving. You know, they're not able to pick up on sound because everything's making a noise so they're going to try to go and dive off someplace if that wind's coming from the south they're going to try to find some a bowl that's got a wall up on that south side so that and gilbert you've seen when we do it it can be howling up on an area oh, we drop off and it's like where did the wind go yeah, exactly yeah, well, it yeah. happened to us this year. We dropped off in a little area, and, you know, we had to win. It was horrible. The wind was horrible that last day we hunted. I mean, just never was going to get right, blowing like a by God. And we dropped off in an area, and, you know, it was going on up above us. But where we were at, it was a whole lot more mundane. And, right. you know, we learned a lot being there, too. <laughs> Them bulls snuck in there on us silent, didn't say a word. Well, you know, uh, so – I mean, it's uh, yeah, it, they they like being out of that wind as well. Sure. So when you find places like that, they're going to be there. You just got to be set up for them and be ready all the time. You know. So I the way I tell guys too is, be the elk, man, mm -hmm. uh, because they're actually feeling a lot like you are. I mean, you're up there, and and if you're having a hard time standing up, find a place where it's going to be easier for you. Yeah. It's easier for you. It's easier for them animals. That's right. right. So uh, think about those types of things. Find those hidden bowls. Find those places where they dive off, you know, where they can get out of that wind because that's what they're doing. And I can tell you, you talk about the canyon, uh, Gilbert, and there can be times in there because those bulls will be up on top in different areas. And 
there'd be times back in the day when we used to hunt that area way back, uh, that there would be no elk in that canyon, but you let a strong wind come up and all of a sudden it started filling up because they were trying to find the holes. Yeah. They were trying to get down there below it all. Yep. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I heard from guys where they, they said, Joe, you know, we listened to y'all's podcast about a midday hunt, but the bulls weren't bugling or responding to calls. So we couldn't shadow them and follow them up. All right. My bad y'all, my bad, because these are rifle hunters that are sending the, this into us. Yeah. And, I did not do a good enough job of preparing you and coaching you from one season to the other, because when it gets to the rifle hunts, that whole midday thing's different. Yeah. Way right? different. Yeah. Because you're right. There is no rut. Those animals, you're not able to shadow. You're not following them up. That's more of a bow hunting tactic. Um, you know, so now with the shorter days, again, most of your time on the midday hunt is going to be, spending time in those glasses up on a vantage point looking for those choked areas looking for a bull that might be getting up to get a little feed in midday might be getting up to get a drink you're just and it's not easy to do and it's not for everybody yeah. because it's I hard oh, it's man. hard man i you know we did it this past couple of weeks ago we'd sit in the evenings or in the afternoons two uh -huh. o'clock we go out two o'clock and we'd sit with a Swarovski spotting scope and just look at cedar bushes right from a right. high vantage point down on these shady slopes and you end up finding some bulls bedded down you know right. but boy it takes a lot of glass work and it takes a heck of a lot of uh of good but not good optics uh, sure. to sit there and you know some shooting sticks where you can put your binoculars on there and you know, we found a couple bulls and then made a plan to go after them, you know. Right. But that's how, man, I, that's totally different from me. I'm a bow hunter, and so the rifle hunting thing I'm kind of getting into, and one of these days I'm going to kill one with my rifle because it's not as easy as people think, I can tell you that. Uh, yeah. A lot of people think it's super easy. It ain't. Uh, you know, no, because I, I, I mean, the, yeah, it, and it depends on which hunt you get. And I got yeah. news for you: you get that first rifle hunt early in October. Yeah, it's uh, tough. but that's a ball game there. But yeah. if the more those boogers get hunted, uh, you know, they start diving off. Yeah. And and again, that midday can be productive in areas if it's conducive to glassing. But guys, not all areas are. And sometimes, you know, uh, you you got if. If you're frustrated, get a nap in, man, and then get yeah. out there in the afternoon and start glassing. Because now the idea is if you can locate them in the afternoon, if you're not able to make a move, they will be in that area in the morning because they're not going to go that far. They're more easy to pattern at this point, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, again, all right. So uh, I also wanted to give guys a, a little scouting tip because a lot of times when you go into an area – you would like to find, you'd like to go to somebody and say, you know, well, where's a good place to hunt around here without saying that, right? <laughs> so, yeah. You know, a lot of times people forget that some of your best recon is not necessarily with other hunters. It's not with the other ranchers. For example, if you're in a restaurant or a business and you strike up a conversation with a local, a great question when you're sitting there is to say, Oh my gosh, how often you have to dodge an elk coming into work around here? Yeah. Right? And, you know, asking that question, a lot of times it's like, man, I tell you what, I almost hit a big bull this morning. Yeah. And I was like, oh, dude, man, uh, give me a heads up because I sure don't want to hit one in my vehicle. And they said, well, you better watch out around mile marker 516. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, you know, uh, you know, do I have to worry about hitting elk when driving at night around this area towards such and such? You, you can bet. ask them. And that can lead to some great tips yeah. from some people that they'll tell you the story about just yesterday or last week or almost every time when I go by. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 It and, makes total sense, man. People love to talk about their place and their, uh, their community and stuff like that, and it, especially if they know you there hunting. Guys, I hope you got something out of that. Um, 
out of that session. Uh, we wanted to help you out with some of the problems that you're having with some things that are coming. Keep sending in questions. That'll kind of drive our themes as we go here and we talk about things. But what we're going to do now is we're going to go to our Elk Bros mailbox. We haven't gotten any questions last week or the, even the week before that. Yeah. And we've had some guys in the lineup and we're going to try to go through these as much as possible. We've got questions from Zach Fisher from Pennsylvania. Um, Brian Taylor's up from Idaho and, uh, Brian Zakovec from Pueblo, Colorado. You guys are on our list right now, so we're going to start out with Zach Fisher first. And Zach says that uh, my four buddies are heading to Idaho in 2020. I'm pumped for you guys, man. Uh, for our first elk hunt, seven to nine days. That's awesome. Um, they're planning either October no or November, no ATV, no UTV, no mules or guides. They're saying that they're hoofing it all themselves. So they're saying that they've been looking into camp options and they were wondering if we think the investment in a lightweight group TP is necessary or is it better for them to stay in smaller tents at base camp as well. So um, we kind of do a combo of both of those because we, of our numbers. We do. And look, man, I ain't going to lie. I'm a big boy. I snore like a freight train, <laughs> right? So guys don't want to be around me. So I go get by myself and everything. And I'm fine with that because I don't want to <laughs> be around all the, the other things that go on inside of a teepee that somebody might do that would be, you know, kind of like that town that's got all them smells in it. So uh, somebody need one of them odor hotlines for sure in our, in our group. So uh, at the end of the day, I, I like to, I like what we do. We have an overall tent uh, right. that kind of a commissary area where everybody, you know, comes and sits and then everybody's got their own little tent, you know, where they sleep. The only thing I'd add to it, though, is is we're doing it in September. These guys are talking about October, possibly November, Ooh. and they're talking about Idaho. Ooh. So, you know, a, a little body heat or, um, you know, the one nice thing about a group area, like what we have at our camp, but it's September, so we're able to have an open air one. Yeah. One nice thing about that is, is I really like the camaraderie. We like all being together. And if yeah. you have a group area, that kind of adds to that. You get a chance to razz each other. I mean, I, if Gilbert was in a big TP with us, uh, mm. I get a chance to, God dang, dude, you know, yeah, throw you stuff out. about Unleashed, him. I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> but it's those things. It's the good, the bad, the ugly that uh, – yeah. the, the, Well, you'll do it those... one time, and that may be the only time, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it makes memories. So, you know, the, the one thing about the smaller tents is – yeah, the only thing is, is in if you get up in there in November, getting in and out of that could be a cold deal. Uh, and yeah, I'd, and it I'd might. suggest y'all tack pack in your buddy heater and put it in your tent because it's gonna be chilly. Well, actually, he was he he brings that up because he says uh, he, it was funny, man. He busts me here. He said, Joe, I know you've said many times that you guys are fire free, but if we're going in October, November, we've been looking at a tent stove for warmth and. Uh, what I want to tell you guys is, look, that, that September we're bow hunting, that rifle hunt thing is a whole different deal. Yeah. And I would definitely, I mean, having someplace warm uh, is, 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 can be paramount. It's huge. And for you guys, I would tell you, if you do do a TP and there's four of you, I would get one that sleeps 12 or 16 yeah. because you're going to need some room because they do not build those things. For and man they, size when, fellas. <laughs> no, because I, what Gilbert, you sleep in a four man tent. Is that what no, that is? Uh -uh, mine's a six man tent. <laughs> it's a six man, six man tent. And they, yeah, it's all up just for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you right now, when they tell you it's two man tent, no, it's barely for one. And, if they tell you yeah. it's a four man, I mean it's barely for one. You know, and I, and it and what the way they measure that is they take a look at where sleeping bags can go side by side. It's it. not talking about gear or anything like that. Yeah, and so, I sleep on a nice cot and stuff like that. So I mean, some guys sleep on an air mattress. I know some are Venezuelan mafia. That's what they do. Uh, but yeah, I like to have a lot of room so I can put my gear in there and keep it out of the weather and stuff like that. So sure. We have a little now, vestibule off of my tent too, so we can keep our gear dry and our shoes dry and stuff like that. 
especially in a, in a sleeping area like that. But please, guys, make sure that it's vented good. You know, yeah. make sure you guys are smart with that uh, so that uh, you don't have any bad things happen. He also had, he had in his question, I think we all prefer October because in our minds, uh, we want to get out there earlier for more elk rut action. And, you know, that's hit or miss, and it depends. The earlier, I mean, if you can get out there and that anywhere from the first to the 10th of October, yes, you can get a whole lot more rut action. And like I said, man, that first rifle hunt around the 1st, the 4th, the 5th is just incredible. So you bet. If you have to go in November, I would say the later in November, because it's likely you're going to have snow any place in it, yeah. the later the better. Because, again, the later Pushes. it gets, the more those bulls are having to get out to eat. So that's my recommendation there. Joe, um, is that grizzly country as well in Idaho? I, I could not tell you, man. Yeah, that's um, something they I, need to find out. You know? I, you know, you know what? I don't think so much it's grizzly country as it is wolf in in some of those areas. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, in talking to guys from Idaho, it, I hear different things. I hear some guys saying that that whole wolf thing, it is what it is. And I hear some people saying that I think a lot of guys use that as an excuse too. Um, I, I'm not able to tell you because I haven't hunted it, but that again, is kind of like the wind. It's kind of like the moon. Mm -hmm. If it's something you have to deal with, you know, you have to deal with it. You make the best it, yeah. out of it. You got to overcome it. Right. And I got to get a, give a shout out to Zach. He was in H town a, a week ago and uh, I apologize. We were going to try to have dinner. Uh, he's a nice guy. We've been texting and sending pictures back and forth. And uh, Zach shout out to you, brother. I'm sorry, but we're uh we're building a company right now, and I'm telling you, every waking minute that I got that I'm not in the woods somewhere, I'm on the road. So uh, I wasn't going to be. But, Gilbert, he he told me, but I got a text from him and said, oh, my God, this guy turned me on to the greatest restaurant ever. Yeah, he, so. he, he texted me. He said, oh, my God, this was epic. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> buddy. Uh, I, you know, being here from H-Town, as long as I've been here, uh, if you guys need – if y'all are ever traveling here – Y'all hit me up on uh, on Facebook or Instagram, something like that. I'll give you a good restaurant. That is Gilbert to. at elkbros.com. That's right. G-I-L-B-E-R-T at yeah. elkbros.com. In H-Town, we can get you some good good, good vittles in your stomach, I promise you. You won't be disappointed. <laughs> Zach he, had a blast at Vic and Anthony's. There we go. Yeah. So he also asked us, I personally want to take my bow because I love archery significantly more, but feel that it'd be nearly impossible for me to successful to be successful given that my compadres are all set on the rifle and tactics are clearly drastically different. Is my thinking correct? Um, I'm going to tell you no. Uh, I think you have as just from my perspective, you got as much opportunity with that, uh, with that bow in October as you do a rifle. If you're calling or getting on critters because they're because they're screaming and they're bugling uh, a buddy of mine was out hunting this last hunt and opening morning called in a bull for himself 80 yards shot it at 80 yards but that with the rifle but that bull was coming in the next morning his brother shot one at 45 yards yeah. so it's it can happen no matter whether your your guys are, are using that the only thing i'd worry about is make sure you're in orange and you know you guys uh you got to think about that if guys are out there with rifles man yeah, yeah i mean please you know, be safe we were in that portion of like i said two weeks ago where the bulls were shut up not talking and i got us in position i thought i saw a bull uh but i wasn't 100 percent sure so i took my cousin and i we skirted around the left and man lo and behold bull walks out 20 yards from us and uh, I could have smoked. He had no clue we were there. I could have right. smoked him with my bow, you know. Definitely. And, and he had his mouth wide open. I don't know if he'd just been in a fight or what, but he was wore out and about ready to fall out, you know. So uh, we were actually we were actually scouting for another set of hunters. My cousin had already sh shot out, and we were scouting for somebody else. We were able to get on a radio and get those guys over there in position. And uh, Matt took that bull. So uh, it was really cool to watch we were from a higher vantage point the bull was actually going down to water um, mm -hmm. we made the call and th they uh they moved into position when they moved into pos position we got to watch it from the the upper vantage point and he took a he took that is a probably about a 330 class bull it was a beautiful bull man mm -hmm. and uh, but had we not found that bull you know and, and got close to him we probably 
we probably bumped him a little bit, but he was not he was not too worried about us. He saw us and kind of just hurried along, but you know, it wasn't like he blew up, but he was tired, man. I mean, that sucker yeah, right. uh, wore out from the rut. What I would tell you though, Zach, is there's another way to think about this too, man. Uh, think outside the box is I would partner hunt where you carry your bow, your buddy carries the rifle. Yep. You get in a situation where you have the opportunity because it's a close shot, bingo, you're in the money. You have that opportunity where it's not a close shot, somebody's bringing home the elk, right? So mm -hmm. that's something for you to think about. And I think his last question was, we're talking a lot about getting a combo tag for Idaho, elk and mule deer. The logic to us is, <laughs> Gilbert, this ought to make you feel good. We'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. This boy's been listening to you, Gilbert. Like a good handgun. There you go. Yep. That being said, for me, I don't want to get caught up chasing muleys and lose sight of the real goal, elk. And, <laughs> you know, he said there's there's also cost impl you know, implications sure, of the sure. combo tags. But so – here's here's the thing that i would tell you about that i don't think that it becomes a distraction when you start chasing muleys mm -mm. generally if you're hunting elk you're hunting elk and then when if you come across a muley you have that opportunity to take it down that's kind of been our our way in yeah camp. or I mean, or if you've already harvested your elk you can keep on hunting you know right keep like Luis did you know um i, I could have done the same thing so and i passed on a couple of opportunities to shoot some smaller mule deer you know uh so yeah i've always wanted to have it if i drew a tag man i dang sure wanted to have it in my pocket you know? right and, you know, this next question uh, is, is a tough one, and I don't know that I have an answer. It's from Brian Taylor from Idaho. And, buddy, I, I would love to have this situation. I would love to be in your back pocket, Brian, for this and try to figure it out because I love a challenge. And it, Brian says that they've been hunting an area there in Idaho for 10 years, and, and what they decided to go to a different location in the Idaho desert. And they're seeing elk all the time there, but they're saying that they're not hardly vocal at all they spot them at first light coming from ag fields and then right at dark headed out but never say in the same place so it's not like they're able to pattern mm -hmm. and and i guarantee you that's because i mean he's hunting this in prime time september right so those mm -hmm. bulls are, go are going to be moving all over the place they're, yeah. they're not going to be patterned they're traveling um, yeah and it says being so flat we can't follow him to a bedding area and them being non-vocal, you end up tracking them till they're right there, and then they blow out. It says, we've tried call, cow calling and no response. Just wondering if you have any ideas. He said that uh, these elk are not staying close to water. They'll travel five to eight miles at night for feed and water. And he said that they did get bulls to be responsive um, at night about 1030. So they do talk, but they believe just never when it's light. And you know what we do have some of this same situation because we have areas that are are pretty much kind of rolling not flat like they're dead but it's kind of rolling and it's uh, scrub oak that some of that scrub oak goes up uh you know eight ten feet a lot of low stuff and a lot of those elk will bed down not up on the ridges but down in that scrub oak and a lot of times uh, they're not responding either because that's exactly where I'm talking about. We go through moving real slow, doing our cow calling for them to come in silently. And the only thing that I would tell you, Brian, because it's a tough one. Again, I would have to experience. Are, are they sure? Are, are they bow hunting for sure? You know that for sure, Joe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. They were bow hunting. They were, it was in okay. September. So what they were doing was they were actually getting on elevation, you know, either following track, trying to follow these guys, uh, or they were getting an elevation where they could see them trying to get in on them, but they would end up blowing them out. And the only thing mm. about that is in that desert like that, now you guys are always on the same level. So it's just about keeping the wind in your face. Exactly. They may be up against some property lines or something like that where you can't keep the wind in your face, you know. And if that's yeah. the case, then you can't go after them because you will blow them out. Yeah. And I think for me, I would be trying just about everything I could. I, I would consider decoys. Yeah. Um, 
I, I would also, instead of trying to get to them, I think I would get in an area with a decoy mm -hmm. and I would try doing kind of a breeding sequence because I'm not going to worry about them responding to me mm -hmm. vocally. Mm -hmm. But I think if I can convince that and, and doing this with other sounds, not with bugles, right. doing, doing this with raking Rake on some trees. of those junipers, yep. doing this with a little bit of glunking, some huffing, mm -hmm. maybe a cow call here and there. But mm -hmm. you got to match it to your environment. If their cows are not talking a lot, you don't want to talk a lot. You mm -hmm. got to kind of try to play their game as to what their environment is. That's it. You know, I, again, dude, I would love to go and try this and see what I could do to make it happen. I think a lot of times I might just friggin' shut up um, and and put the sneaky Mohican on them. I mean, yeah, man. And, and it's tough because you got a lot of eyeballs with all those cows and stuff like that or get in tight enough to where when they get up, I might be able to get them to make a mistake. But mm -hmm. It's a tough one, man, Brian. I mean, that's that's really tough. But I, for me, I think that'd be kind of exciting, man, in, uh, in trying that out. So I want to wish you luck on that. And Gilbert, we're, we're, we've got Brian in the lineup, and then we've got some more behind him. Brian, bud, we're going to have to save you for next time. We're just over our hour right now. Uh, and we've covered a lot of content. Absolutely, Joe. Guys, you know, if you like what we're doing, please – subscribe rate and review you have to go to apple podcast or itunes to review us and and you can check out more elk hunting content on elkbros.com uh, yeah and and i'll tell you gilbert um if you guys will go and join our camp our elk camp at elkbros.com we send a, a weekly uh email that tells you about our podcast coming up it'll tell you about anything that's on our site and if you guys have not gone to our elk bros youtube channel you need to go there because we have some ornellis unleashed we have each of those uh <laughs> each of those stories separated out so you can watch some of them are seven minutes some of them are six minutes and you can see each one you got to go watch that because i tell you what it's one thing to listen to gilbert <laughs> but he's pretty animated too man it's gilbert i but I, I sure enjoyed those. We had, we had a blast doing that last week, Joe. There you go. And, uh, uh, and another thing, you know, guys, if you got questions and you want us you to bet. air them here, please go to info at elkbros.com and drop us an email. You bet that's you, man. Info at elkbros.com. Joe, I just wanted to mention real quick, Chav's doing good. The prayers are all working. We feel it working. Uh, and you know, my, my buddy, Chad Williams, uh, he's, uh, on his road to recovery. I mean, it was touch and go with him, all the prayers and all the well wishes, man. We thank all of our grinders out there for praying for Chad. And, and, and I, I'll tell you, uh, uh, you know, we've got, you know, Chad, where he's at is, is he's leveled out, not in pain right now. Um, but we still have a, a, a lot of road ahead of us. And, uh, so yeah, we appreciate that from you guys. Please, man, if, please if keep just... Chad Chavez in your prayers. Uh, and, uh, again, like I said, Chad Williams on his road to recovery, they got him moved into rehab. So we're, uh, we thank all of you guys out there for that. You know, it's been a great show, Joe, epic topics. I mean, you know, all, we wish all our grinders out there, uh, good luck in this rifle season coming up. It's going to start getting cold. That snow white stuff's going to start hitting the ground. It's going to be really cool. Again, guys, send us some pictures on our on our web page too, so we can we can uh, enjoy in your kills. It's so celebrate fun, to, you guys. You it's, yeah, celebrate. It's so fun to get our phones and have a have a text or something like that with y'all's successful pictures and everything like that. Man, it's been it's been awesome to see. So we want to thank all of our listeners for that. From me here in Spring, Texas, and Joe in New Mexico, I want to thank all our grinders out there. God bless all of you. you know, husbands, kiss your wives. Wives, kiss your husbands. Hug your babies. Keep your broad heads sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting. God bless everybody. God bless.